these two months, we are going to be talking about the crowd of witnesses. Right. The crowd of witnesses. We'll cover what these witnesses actually are witnessing later on. Right. Uh, we have this idea that the saints of old are up in heaven watching us. But actually, that's not what it is. Okay, we'll talk about that later. And this is chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. Bible reads, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Verse 3 And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were for all men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, continually. And he repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and he grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I had made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's great. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word, thank you for your truth. He does guide us into thy truth, Lord. Uh, help us, sanctify us, sanctify us, build our lives in the church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> we are told, we are told that in Genesis 6, after the fall, when the population of the world reached a certain amount, a certain number, that the world was a wicked and evil place. And the Bible says that the thoughts of their heart, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. The world was a wicked and evil place that from a world of beauty and light from the beginning in creation, Genesis 1 and 2, right? everything that was very good the earth and its inhabitants had only grown darker, deeper in sin, and further away from God. It's a moving in one direction away from God, from the time of creation and the fall. And it went on for a time until God could stand it no longer. And we talked this morning about Sunday school. The cart pressed with the sheaves piling up on top of the sins. Right? God is you know, tolerating and tolerating, and soon it will, it's, it will break. And his wrath will be poured out, and this is what is actually happening here. And it went on for a time until God could stand it no longer, so much so that the next best thing for the world was to be destroyed. <clears throat> what do you mean the next best thing for the world was to be destroyed? Nonetheless, we are told, but, but what? Now let us begin with establishing certain foundational truths before we move further. Right? God is a God of love. First John 4.8 that means he only is that he desires only the highest good for anything and everything, including all of his creation. God is a God of love and he only desires the highest good for anything and everything. Anyone, anything is creation involved, included. He only wants the highest good. And if he said that he would destroy man. Uh, and beast and birds. You notice, uh, God says He will destroy man and beast and birds, but He never said He will destroy the world itself in a sense, right? But He said He will destroy man and beast and birds. And if He said that, it meant that it would have been for the best. Nonetheless, the point is that God desires only the highest good. And if destruction is determined, then we must also understand that it is for the highest good. Right? That's the first foundational truth we must understand. God only wants the highest good for anything and everyone. Secondly, God is not willing that any should perish. Second Peter 3 9, we find that there. We will not go into the verses at this point. If God determined that all the souls living at that point were to be destroyed, 
then God probably knew that not a single one of them would have repented. God would have known in his omniscience that in his decision to destroy the world is that all these people are past the point of change, past the point of redemption. There's no more hope for them in their heart. He knows they will not repent. And that's the next best thing is the destruction. Because God is not willing that any should perish, and if He knew that He's not willing that any should perish, and destroying them there and then would send them to hell, that would have been the next best thing already. That would have been the best thing already. So we must understand this two foundational truths. God only desires the highest good, and He's not willing that any should perish. <clears throat> we find a similar situation, I believe, on a smaller scale in the story of Sodom. Genesis 18:32. Than with me. 1832 he says, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. This is uh, Abram, right? Abram talking to God uh, when he realized that the three figures that appeared at Mount Ray, right? the three figures, one of them was God the Son, the other two were angels. Right? He realized who he was talking to, and he said, They were on the way to Sodom to destroy it because the sin of the city was great. And he pleaded because Abraham knew Lot, his nephew, was there, and his family. He said, hey, no, if the city is destroyed, then my, my, my block and his family will die. And he pleaded with God, he said, uh, you know, <clears throat> per adventure, God, let me, if I can speak, right? if there were 20 righteous, will you destroy the city for 20? He said, I won't destroy it for 20. He said, okay, 15, 10, and then 5. <clears throat> and this is the verse that says, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, you know, even 5, which 10. And let the Lord not be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Her adventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. For the sake of ten righteous, righteous in the sense that they will they will believe on the Lord. Right? How are we righteous? We are righteous means justified, right? How are we justified by faith? Means we believe in God, right? So if there were ten saved people there, he said, I will destroy the city. Well, of course, they couldn't even find ten. Abraham pleaded for God to spare the city of Sodom if ten righteous, godly people would come there and God agreed. But the sad reality is that there were not even ten. And the same thing here was about to happen in Noah's time, but on a grander scale. The whole world was so evil that God was going to destroy it. And there were not even ten godly people out of the probably thousands or even hundreds of thousands to be found in the like the world was a young earth at the time, all right? <clears throat> I don't think there were millions, but maybe hundreds of thousands of people, maybe scattered groups of civilized civilizations, moved up villages, maybe the world. <clears throat> but there were at least thousands of people, if not even ten, were found to be righteous and godly. But then, praise the Lord, we read in Genesis 68, it says, But no world found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you think God was pleased and happy that he could hold back his judgment in utterly wiping out all the living creatures and men on the earth because Noah was faithful? I think so. I think when God looked at the earth and he said, Ah, Noah has found grace in my eyes. Amen. I don't have to destroy mankind. Because the Bible tells us that is the heart of God. He is not willing that any should perish. If I can save mankind, I will. Because of this one man, I will hold back my judgment. You see, God looks for people, individuals, groups, to stand in the gap between Him and His judgment on the people, on the world, on groups of people, or the world in general. He looks for people to stand between Him and the judgment. And that those people who stand between Him is not say, God, stop. No, it's not. It's, they are righteous in sense. They believe God forgive us our sin. You know, he, wants, he looks for people to plead on behalf of the others to him because he wants to stay his hand he wants that is the heart of God he does not want to destroy you if he can he loves you he cares for you but a God of love is also a God of holiness first and foremost we must understand that and as a righteous judge he must punish the unjust All right but <clears throat> if there are some that find grace in his sight he will go back you will know, find that you see in um, later on we'll get that right God, I believe that God was happy that he could withhold his judgment in terms of destroying the whole of mankind, humanity in that sense, human beings. Of course, the whole world died in the flood, but humans as in general as a race was not wiped out because of Noah. 
Because it will be in line with what he tells us about his heart as we read in 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, God already knew. You see, how can God know, not know that Noah would have been the one to be preserved? He would have known that even before creation. So why would he say that I'm going to destroy everybody if he already knew that he was not going to do that? It was just that he's just narrating to us in his word that the state of the world at this point in time. It was so bad, right? was so bad that God had come to a place where he was like, you know what? The world needs to the, the world needs to go. The, the people and the beasts in the world need to go because of sin. <clears throat> But the point is that in every generation, there is a preserved line of people that God looks to and works in and through to preserve what He has created. When we say that Noah found grace, it is not saying that Noah was worth saving because he did something. No. It's not like Noah did something and said, oh, he found grace. I, I did something and I managed to achieve this salvation of grace. No. When we say that Noah found grace, it means that grace was given to Noah. If grace cannot be earned. If it's earned, it's not grace. If it's grace, then it cannot be earned. Because grace is something unmerited favor. That is grace. We cannot earn it. So, how did Noah get this grace? By faith. By faith. Believe. Noah was a true believer in God, Jehovah, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That is to say, imputed righteousness in salvation. Noah was a saved man because of his belief in God, Jehovah. And how did he come to believe in God, Jehovah? Noah and his family were the only ones saved in the world at the time. Eight souls out of the hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many people were alive at that point in time, only eight souls were true. Say, can you imagine the kind of world that you're living in? If only eight people were saved, how a dark place and sinful and dangerous place it would have been. Right? There were no, there was no legal courts in those days like we have today. There was no police force. There was no uh, civil defense ambulance. People just did whatever they want. They killed people they didn't like. Like Cain, you know, and then the other guy was his name. Uh, if Cain was. Uh, Punished, uh, if anyone who kills Kate will be uh, punished seven times, then I will be punished 70 times, seven times, right? What was his name? I can't remember that. One of his descendants. Okay? The point is, people were prideful, they were doing anything and everything they wanted. You read in the judges, you find very, very drastic things that people were doing. <clears throat> but the point here is that no one was a true believer in God, Jehovah, and was called unto him for righteousness. In salvation. Noah and his family were the only ones saved in the world at the time. And for that, for the sake of Noah and his family, God would not destroy humanity and he would not destroy all the beasts and all the fowl of the earth. In all generations, as I mentioned, God seeks out the people who would stand in between him and him pouring out his judgment unequivocally. And Noah was that one. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 and 31. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 and 31. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them, I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. God looks for people who stand between him and his judgment, pleading for the others. Right? And in Ezekiel we found that this is talking about Jerusalem at that point in time. Judgment upon Israel. Upon Israel. But here Noah stood in the gap for the world. And for that, God saved humanity, He saved the beast and the power of the earth that He had determined to destroy. Because Noah believed God, 
And by simply doing that, simply by believing God, having faith, God gave grace as He desires to do. And no one in His family like us are to be the witnesses of His great love and grace to all mankind. That's what Hebrews 12 1 is all about. Alright? Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, what is this cloud of witnesses? Like I said, this cloud of witnesses is often alluded to being witnesses of what is happening on earth. As if they were watching, as if they were watching the saints on earth and rooting for them from beyond the clouds in heaven. Like you know, my grandfather, you know, our relatives must have sell by in heaven is looking at us. But the Bible actually never tells us that they are doing that. Then what are they witnesses of? They are witnesses of God's love, His grace. They are witnesses that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is real, that He died for mankind, and He is risen from the grave. He is on the right hand of the Father. That is what they are witnesses to. They are witnesses not of the living saints, but as witnesses of Christ. They are witnesses of Christ, His deity, His humanity, the salvation He provides, His promises for His people, His grace, His love. They are witnesses of Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith, as written in verse 2. For the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. These are what they are witnesses of, of a life lived and for many died by faith. This is what it talks about. The so great a count of witnesses have run before us. So therefore now we are encouraged to live that same life as them. To be witnesses of Christ. To be witnesses of His grace, of His mercy in your life. How He has changed you. How He has saved you. How He has brought you up from the pits. To raise you up to, you know, being justified as a son of God. Living on a higher plane in this world. That doesn't make sense to people. You know, how come you're so happy despite you suffering so much? How come you can turn the other cheek when people slap you 70 times? Because, you know, the Bible says so. Because I'm living on a different plane from you. I'm not living in the flesh. I'm not walking by sight. I'm walking by faith. Right? But are we doing that? Are we living as those witnesses who have gone before us and live? <clears throat> and that brings us to our lesson this morning, point number one. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, was Noah a good guy? I don't think so. Noah was not a good guy. The Bible says, you know, Jesus himself says, Why call us thou only good? There's one good, and that's the Father who is in heaven. Right? There's no good guy or good girl, woman or man in this world. None of us are good. There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 10. How then did Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord if he too was just like everybody else around him who were in sin? How come Noah was so special? Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 12 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved in fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith. By believing what God says. Faith. The object of his faith was real, the right one, and his faith was a real saving faith. All right? The Bible tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord by faith. Noah didn't believe God because God saved him from the flood. You know? When I say that again, this is important. Noah didn't believe God because God saved him from the flood. Noah believed God before even God told him that there was a flood coming. You understand? That's the difference. We don't believe and have faith in God because God has proven something to us. We believe God is who He says He is, and then He will show you who He is. Because you have the faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. That was the faith that Noah had. That it was that was the life Noah was living, the life in tune with God. How did Noah come to possess that knowledge and faith in God? Romans 10, 3, 13 to 14. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? Noah had a preacher in his life. Who was his preacher? Probably his father, the man. How did Noah know how to call upon the Lord? Someone taught him how to do that. Someone taught him to do probably his father Lamech and his grandfather Methuselah and his great his great grandfather Enoch. That same Enoch was taken because he, he walked with God in Genesis. Genesis 4 6 and to Seth. To him also there was born a son and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And from the time of Seth, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. And that amount of men that began, began to call upon the name of the Lord obviously dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. And there was only no one left. No only no one left. And it's generally who was still calling on the name of the Lord. Before, when God passed the judgment, the rest of the world didn't stop. The rest of the world said, I have to tell me your grandfather's story about this God and his creator. And, nah, I don't believe this. The rest of the world had fallen away. They, they, they didn't believe. Noah was the only one left in his family who was still calling upon the name of the Lord from sin. No one knew God and believed God because he was taught about the Lord from his father and his ancestors who were godly men. What a blessing it is to have godly men through whom God works to minister in your lives. Amen? Amen. Each one of us is seated here because someone told you about Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. And you, it's your job now as a Christian to go and tell other people to save the world, to save them from the depths of hell that Christ is not willing for them to go to. Hell was not prepared for man. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels and created them because mankind decided to follow Satan in sin rather than follow God in righteousness. But God doesn't want you to do that. And we, it's our job to tell the people of this. That is where it all begins. Having godly parents in the Lord to children who are born into this world. Thank God for that. And therefore, truly, we can say, praise the Lord, because He is the author and finisher of that faith no one had. And likewise, the Lord is the author and finisher of the faith that you have. Author and finisher of the faith that you have. So that's point number one. Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord because he had faith. Because he called upon the name of the Lord. Because someone taught him to. Point number two. Noah lived by his faith. Noah lived by his faith. Doesn't, doesn't matter if you have, doesn't matter if you have faith and you're not living by it. James says, "Show me your works, and I'll show you my faith." Right? You need to prove, I'm not saying you need to prove to other people, but if you truly have a saving faith, then your life will be lived in that manner. Your life will live in that manner, right? If you believe that the sun will rise tomorrow, you will go to sleep tonight. Right? Because you believe that the sun will rise again. If you know that the sun will never rise again and the world will be destroyed, once you go to bed, you go to sleep, you go to sleep. Right? You go to sleep. How do you sleep? You'd be too scared to sleep, right? You lock the door on, at your house. You know you are sick, there will be no robbers. And you go and sleep peacefully because you trust that the lock will do its job. If you don't have faith in the lock, you'll sit there watching the door and go back to the the Lord will come in. Right? That's faith. You live according to your faith, you what you believe in. If you believe in the object that is Christ that can save you, you will live by that faith. Right? You won't keep trying to do things to save yourself. You get what I mean? The point here is faith. No one lived by his faith. No one acted on his faith, demonstrating that it was real. James 2 26 For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. God told Noah to build an ark, and Noah obeyed. Noah didn't know what the ark was for. The Bible tells us in Genesis 6 22, thus did Noah according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And not just that, he preached repentance. Noah preached repentance to the world for about a hundred years. How do we know hundred years now? Second Peter 2 5 tells us, and spared not the whole world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. So we know Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching repentance, bringing in the flood. On the world of ungodly. Genesis 5 32, 5 32. And Noah was 500 years old, and he began Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So he was 500, and he gave birth, he got Shem, Ham, and Japheth at 500. Genesis 7 
6. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. So there was 100 years. So Noah was preaching 100 years repentance because judgment is coming and the world didn't listen. They laughed him to scorn. They said, what do you need a boat for? They said, oh, there's going to be a flood. What's a flood? They've never seen a flood before. The world imagine. You must remember the world, although humanity had degraded to a certain point, the world was still in a very pristine state. Right? It was still surrounded by a wall of water, a layer of water. Right? The, the, the continents may have been in a different position as of today, George, George, geographically. We know in the beginning God watered the world with a mist, not by rain. So the Bible doesn't say, but we don't know if no one actually experienced rain before. There were no rainbows in those days. The, the weather was different. Uh, there were probably no seasons also at that point in time. It was a one cool, nice to live in environment to an extent, to a large extent. And Genesis 7 6, and Noah was 600 and given a came. Noah was an example of a life that was producing the fruits of salvation. Noah believed God and acted on his faith even though he did not have a full explanation from God. Hebrews 11, 7 tells us, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Things not seen as yet could have been the rain, could have been the flood. Right? Never seen it before, don't know what it is. But he built the ark as God commanded him to according to the measurements that God commanded him to. He didn't know what it was for, he didn't know what it was going to do. But God said do it and he do it. The rest of the world claim this guy crazy. Still, building this structure here. You know, if you've never seen or heard of the things you're talking about, this guy must be mad. Right? And they were laughing at him. But he did what God wanted him to do. The word fear used here, he moved with fear. Fear is not afraid. No one wasn't afraid of what was coming because he didn't even know what was coming. He, the word fear here means reverence. No one built the ark because he respected God. God says do it, so I will do it. I don't understand fully what this is for. I don't understand fully what this is going to do. I don't understand why these dimensions, why so big. It took him 100 years to build the ark, right? God gave him the command almost 100 years, right? He was building and building and building. He's like, wow, well, I had day and night, non-stop, every day, all day, every day for 100 years, almost building this structure that I don't even know what it's for. Right? God says there's judgment coming, or there's a flood, or there's going to be rain. I mean, I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what God told Noah, but he re respected God and he just obeyed what God wanted him to do. What about us? What about us? Do we understand what God wants us to do all the time? We don't, right? We pray for something that doesn't answer, maybe something else happens, maybe something unexpected happens, and they are not God, not them. And then we question him rather than accept and move on by faith. Are we living by faith or by sight? The word fear here is not that of being afraid, but comes from the Hebrew word meaning reverence. Essentially, it means that Noah moved not because he was afraid of what was coming, but because he revered God and his commandments, even though he did not fully understand what was coming. Like I said, you may not have even seen a flood or rain before. The question is are you living by faith? Do your actions show it? That's number two. No one lived by his faith. Number three. God had respect towards Noah's faith in him. We find the term used in Exodus 2 25. <clears throat> Exodus 2 25. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. What does that mean? It comes from the Hebrew word meaning to know, the word respect, to respect him. Does God need to respect us in the sense of that? You know, in the sense of like a son must respect the father, I know not that kind of respect. The word respect here means to know, to acknowledge, to recognize. It was considered. God was aware of. God discerned. God perceived. He took note of. Marked in a good way. Sure of. That's what the word respect means. God knew Noah's faith. He acknowledged Noah's faith. He recognized it. He considered Noah's faith. He took note of Noah's faith and he marked Noah's faith in a good way. 
Precious to the Lord is the faith of his saints in him. 2 Peter 1 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained my precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. When we have faith in God, he values it and he doesn't let him down. God values your faith in him. Right. He values your faith in him. Isaiah 1 1 10. Fear thou not, for I am the deep, be not the same, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, I will come holy to the right hand of my righteousness. 2 Timothy 1 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. It's like a father you know, whose son tells everyone around him how proud he is to have him as a father. Right? That father would never want to let his son die. It's like, I always catch my son at 5 p.m. every day from school, from the school again. So he always tells his friends, my daddy will come at 5 p.m. every day. And then when I hear him telling his friends that, I'm like, oh, I better not be late. <laughs> like his faith in me is so strong every day, but I'm not catching it. And then, if I'm late, he'll, I'll, I'll be like letting him down, right? He talks so highly of me in front of his friends that they're angry. Right? That's how God feels as a father. When you have faith in him and you express it, he's like, oh, wow, my children believe in me. I, okay, I'm going to stand up for them. I'm going to show up for them. I'm going to do what I say for them. Right? But of course, you have to be right with me in the first place, lah, right? But the point is, that is the heart of God. That is the heart of God. He respects the faith, and he has respect unto the faith. He acknowledges it. He considers it, he looks upon it highly. This is the heart that God has towards us, especially all those who trust in Him. When you learn to trust fully on God, you will discover God's faithfulness. But you cannot be half hearted. You cannot be half hearted. James 1 8, the double minded man is unstable in all his ways. It is always after you take the leap of faith in God that you will find and experience. The Lord catching you. You must first jump, otherwise the time catch you. Right? <clears throat> you must take that deep faith. God had respect for His Lord's faith. And last point this morning: the legacy of God's faithfulness. The Bible tells us that God brings all who trust in Him into a place of renewal, revival, peace, and joy. Genesis 1. And God remembered Noah and every living thing. See, God is not just a God. Macro things. He's a god of micro things. You remember Noah, Ham, Shem, Jephthah, Noah's wife, Ham, Shem, Jephthah's wife. You remember every little bird in the in the in the ark, every snake, every you know insect, every little spider in the nook and cranny of the ark. God remembered them. He preserved them. He made sure they were alive when the, when the rain was there. He made sure they were stayed alive long enough for them to exit the ark and be replenished. Every single thing, every living creature you see a live thing, little one, God remembered them. It says here, and God remembered the world and every living thing, and all the cattle that were killed in the earth. And God made the wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuage. Now, when you say God remembered the world, doesn't mean that God forgot him for a while ago. The word remember here means that Noah was the object of God's keen attention. God was attentive to Noah. God had marked him closely. God was mindful of him and carried him through to a new world. And so it is, once again, we find in the grand scheme of humanity, the pattern. God commands, man fails. In his holiness, God pronounces judgment. In his mercy, he does not entirely consume and destroy. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, right? Because the compassion is filled not the Bible says. He looks for men or group of people to stand in the gap, and there will always be that person there because he works through men by faith, right? In faith. And in his grace, he provides a way for men to carry on. We will find this pattern repeated throughout the different dispensations. And God told Adam, don't eat, Adam eat. God pronounced judgment, Adam falls into death. Spiritual and physical death. Toil the land, the ground is cursed, so on and so forth. God provides grace to carry on. He gives them the skin of the, the, the animal skins as a clothing. Right? He teaches them how to offer sacrifice to him for atonement of sin. Cain decided to disobey again, judgment. And then so on and so forth. Noah. War says, replenish the earth, they build, they go and build a uh, that was after Noah. Noah first. 
judgment, destroy the world, grace to carry on. New world, disperse, replenish the earth. What happened? They stayed together and took up our Babel. Whole earth of the most was of one speech, all congregated in one place, built the tower of Abel to try and reach the heavens to be as gods, giving glory to themselves and not God, disobeying him in dispersing the earth to replenish, confound confusion of languages, judgment again, then grace again to carry on. You'll find the pattern repeated even until today. Right. But in every dispensation, you'll find that it's a group of people preserved to do the will of God. All those who have faith and believe what God says, and that is you and I today, the churches of the Lord in the world. We are to be that people to stand in the gap, to plead with the Lord, forgive us, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Restore us unto the right fellowship with you. Help us reach these people who are lost, your family, your friends. We are to be that people to stand in the gap. But you know what the reality of the Christians today is? You know, not, many Christians are not standing in the They are joining the wayside. They are joining the, the, the sinful world, the sinful flesh. They are doing things that we shouldn't be doing. We are not coming to church as we should. We are not praying as we should. We are not reading the word of God as we should. We are not growing in spiritual maturity as we should. And God is looking on the earth and looking for people to stand in the gap between Him and His judgment that is coming and will come. Rapture will come. Tribulation will come. Because we know, again, man will always fail. And it's always by His grace to carry on, right? But the point is, are you doing what you need to do that God has commanded us to do? If that is the question for you to answer. Noah answered God. Abraham answered the call. David, Solomon, all these men, they are you know, men of sin. Noah got drunk. Moses, you know, beat the rock when he's supposed to speak to it. You know, all those things. Abraham told Sarah his wife to lie. About him being his sister, so on and so forth. You know, Isaac, Jacob wrestled with God himself. He used his scheming and cunning rather than trusting in God. All these people, same as us. But they answered the call, they stood in the gap. We used to stand in the gap. How many dark nights and dreary days has God seen you through? How many sure die events has He delivered you from? How many pits which we have dug and fallen into ourselves has He pulled you up from? And more than that, on top of all that, even blesses you and above and beyond what we deserve. Truly, each and every one of our lives is a legacy of God's faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 19 23. Is that there with me? Lamentations 3, 19 23. <coughs> this is Jeremiah lamenting Israel and the sin. Do you lament your life? Do you remember and talk to remembrance where you were? used to be, where God has brought you from, where you are now, how blessed you are today. And moving forward, have you determined in your mind that I will serve the Lord? Choose you this day who you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Have you determined that in your mind? Or are you still you know, on the fence? I want to live like the world, I want to enjoy the things of the world, I want to do my thing, you know, I want to pursue my ambitions, my goals, my dreams, or as for me, I will serve the Lord. Which one is it? Lamentations 3, 19-20 Remembering my affliction and my misery, the world and the God, my soul had them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. How does he have hope remembering all the bad stuff? Because he had deliverance from these bad things. Verse 22 It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. He looked back and he saw God. I went through all these things and I'm still here. How come? How can it be? It's only because of the Lord. It is of His mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions, they are not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. Praise the Lord. The author and finisher of our faith. By faith, Lord. By faith, Lord. By faith, may our lives be lived, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable of Him. So by way of application number one, I only have two points of application this morning. Walk by faith and not by sight. God is real. Heaven is real. All those names of those witnesses we read about in the Bible are real. Noah, Abraham, and all those that come before us. Moses, Aaron, you know, men of sin who are saved by grace and rose up, rise, rose up to the call. Answer the call of God. 
I've done this for you, will you not serve me now? He said, yes, I will serve you now. Each and every one of them. Like you, like me. God has done many things for us. Are you willing to say, Lord, yes, I will. I will answer the call. I will stand in the gap. I will do and serve you. That is what the life of a Christian ought to be. Are we living that life? Or are you living your own life, doing what you want? Pursuing your own goals and your own objectives? Right. God is real, heaven is real. All those names of witness, all those witnesses we read about in the Bible are real. The promises of God are real. Your salvation is real. The fact that you are indwelled by God Himself, by the Holy Spirit, is real. You have the fullness of the Godhead in you through, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Sadly, like I say, many Christians are not walking by faith. They prefer to live in and be consumed by the tangible, material, earthly, fleshly, carnal life. Because it's easier than like I said, you don't have to resist that nation so much. It's easier to give in than to fight as a strong soldier in Christ. It's easier to be a babe in Christ than to eat the meat of the word of God, to swallow the difficult things, to carry the cross, to crucify the flesh daily. It's easier to just live and walk on a you know, sea of life and die to have it. So simple. But there is more to life than that. Many Christians prefer not to know, not to understand, not to see the truth in God's word, not to acknowledge the spiritual life and the spiritual warfare that rages on just behind the veil of what can be seen. It is happening right now, right, right here, right now, even in this room. Are you falling asleep? Are you thinking about something other than what God is trying to tell you today? Are you distracted by your phone? Are you scrolling through social media or WhatsApp right now? Then you. We are fighting spiritual battles that we don't even know about. God is trying. Do you see that the enemy is trying to draw your attention away from God? The enemy is trying to draw your attention away from God. Not just here and now, but later today. Tomorrow, next week. You walk out, the car's going to cut your path. Are you going to get angry? Are you going to score loud word? Are you going to try and cheat? Not paying the parking? You know, whatever it is, tomorrow at work you'll find another challenge waiting for you. The devil is there. He's, a, he's planned something for you tomorrow, the day after, the day after, the next week, the next month, next year. He's, uh, he's waiting. He's walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's on an active adversary. He's an active adversary. It's not like a passive adversary. You know? It's not like a terrorist who hide behind children and shoot rockets and hide in some hole. No, he's walking about, looking to kill you, destroy your life so that you're not an effective Christian for the Lord. Are you ready? Are you ready? He has plans to derail you in your walk with the Lord all day, every day, from reading his word, from talking to God in prayer, from being in his house for prayer, from talking to your friends about him, any and everything to do with God. If the enemy can hinder you from it, he will. And he doesn't sleep. The devil doesn't need to sleep. Right? And we often do not see, do not realize, do not know, do not understand, and are often caught in traps because we do not walk by faith. We walk through our human fleshly eyes. We see what we want to see. We don't look at things spiritually. If you look at things spiritually, you have a very different perspective about the world. When your wife is getting angry at you and you know losing her anger, you won't see that eh, you are a lousy wife. If you look at her spiritually, you say this is a lady who is you know affected by sin just like I am. But she is saved and I am saved. I need to love her as a husband, as Christ loved his church and gave himself for it. You'll see that spiritual warfare. Then. You won't see her for her sin, you'll see her as the righteousness of God in Christ. God loves her and I want to love her also, even though she's being hard to love right now. How you look at things. When, the, uh, when a person cuts you off and he keeps a finger at you and on the rope, you say, No, this is sin. This is the sin nature of the man. And I should not get angry at the man. I should be angry at the sin. I should mourn, you know, like the Lord, like the Beatitudes. I mourn and I mourn for this guy's soul. I, I wish he was saved. I wish he knew better. Like I know better. But do we? Or we let the anger get the better of us. Right? When my child is being, you know, throwing a tantrum, do I look at him like, hey, you are a naughty boy? No, I don't like it when people call my son naughty because he's just being himself. He's a little boy affected by the sin nature in him. That's how I look at him. And I, as a spiritual father, in a sense, as, 
as a father whom God has put in his life to lead him in the way of the Lord, should not condemn him for his sin, but to say, you know, Jesus doesn't like this, and he also, you know, sometimes I get angry, but how do we deal with it? How do we manage it? How would God want us to manage it? I should teach him, right? Not, not, not get upset with him because he's being himself, being his sinful self. I see the sin nature of the brother, and I see him as a man of God. It changes your perspective about things. But are we, are we attentive that way? Are we sensitive in that way as a Christian? Do we live like that? Do we walk by faith and see through our spiritual eyes? Or are we living in the tangible, physical world? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Right? We, we have to learn and discipline and train ourselves to walk in the spirit. And we will not give in to the last because we see for what it is. We who are to be witnesses to the life of faith will hardly be able to be witnesses to something we do so little of. Walking by faith. I mean, if you don't even walk by faith, how are you going to be a witness of the faith that you, so, you claim to believe in, the God that you say exists? Romans 1.11 For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You are saved, you need to live your life walking in the Spirit. To live and look at things through your spiritual eyes. To discern the spiritual warfare that is going on around you. See things for what they really are. The just, those justified in Christ, those who have truly received of the Lord's salvation, it says, shall live by faith. Walk by faith and not by sight. That's point number one. Walk by faith, not by sight. Last point this morning is the short one. Be a witness. Tell the people around you how your life is changed because of how God, through your faith, is working in your life. <coughs> you know, this week I met my, uh, you know, this week, just yesterday actually, I met my financial consultant who's a friend of mine. He, he, he says he's a Christian also, which is, I mean, he, I talked to him about salvation, so I think he's saved, but he's going to a uh, he used to go to a covenant evangelical church, now he's in the Methodist church. Anyway, the point is, it's hard to reconcile being a wealth manager. Right? He says, I want to be a wealth manager that is a Christian one. So he asked me, is there any way in the Bible that talks about managing money and all that? I say, living by faith is difficult if you are trying to take things into your own hands. That's what a lot of not what people do, right? That's why we buy insurance, right? That's why we, we want to expand our investment portfolios, right? To diversify, to grow it, to grow our money, to grow our stability, financial, material wealth. And that is what wealth management is all about, that the, that the work is doing. And it's hard to reconcile. I say, bro, you see, why I'm not taking what he says, you see, I have to pay your salary, like that. He, he analyzed my whole financial health, right? See, like that. So what can you do? What? You need to do now is to increase your income. Whether it's from your main source or sideline income. Is there anything that you can do? You know, you gym a lot, right? Maybe you're a trainer, you do things and all that. Can you, is there a way for you to earn money on the side or doing something in your church? Like maybe teaching a Bible class and you charge a fee. I say, no, I cannot profit off that way because th th that's not how I'm supposed to do it. I cannot profit off serving the Lord. Okay, I told him that. So, okay, so is there anything else you can do? You know, drive grab, um, do this, do that. I said, no, no. It's hard to say that I want to walk a life of faith and try to take things into my hands materially at the same time. I cannot. I said I cannot do that. Because I was a normal Christian baby, like, you know, I buy stocks, I like, invest in this, foreign exchange, maybe Bitcoin, whatever. But as a pastor, I cannot do that. I must live by faith first because I have to set an example, right? So if I don't have enough money, the law will provide. That is my stand. The law will never let me back. And I have to live that way, and I cannot say I live this way and then worry about my insurance portfolios at the same time. You get what I mean? So he said, like, okay, he sort of gets it. He sort of gets it. Then what about those pastors outside ladies? Some of them they, they teach a course or they sell like you know uh, uh, podcast CDs and stuff like that. Maybe sell the things and all that. I say, no, I'll be for you. We won't do that. We won't do that in our church. And I won't do that also. But the point here is that when you walk by faith, it will not make sense to the rest of the world. It will not make sense to the rest of the world. It doesn't make sense to me humanly also. I, I, I'm i not like that in the past. I want to have a proper investment portfolio in the past. I was worried about 
what stocks to buy, what to sell, what to hold, what to keep, blah 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 blah. But not anymore. Because I live on, I'm trying to live on a different plane now. I'm trying to trust the Lord for the provision for what I need now. It's no longer what I want, but what I need to survive. Lord, you provide for me so that I can do my work. Take care of my child for me, take care of my wife for me, take care of my health for me so that I don't worry about that. I have a colleague, like I don't know, right? The daughter just wanted to keep me up. Right? Oh. I think he's about it. He chose to not discount him. I'm going to serve the Lord. I cannot worry about him and you know, go to hospital Monday to Saturday, being with him in KK 30 days a month, and then doing chemo and then come and preach. I don't know how to do it. The Lord knows what I can take, lah. Okay, so thank God. Okay, He knows what my limits are. But we need to live like that yourself. You need to live by faith that way, and then be a witness of it as you press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Bear witness along your journey about the new life in Christ, and what a blessing it is to be part of the family of God. That is our life's purpose, brethren. That is your life and my life's purpose as a Christian to glorify God. To be a witness for him. Will you be a witness for him? Will you stand the gap? Will you first decide and make a commitment to live the life of faith, to walk by faith and not by sight? The Bible says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. The gods of the world, of the flesh, of pride, or the Lord God who saved you and gave his life for you. Let's bow <coughs> God is real. Heaven is real. A whole throng of, with, of witnesses that have lived and gone before us are real. They stand in heaven today, bearing witness of Christ, of His deity, of His humanity, of the God who came down into one human flesh and died on the cross and resurrected the third day for us to pay for the sin of humanity and what we have done. He suffered so that we may live. He died so that we might have life eternal. Do you know him? <coughs> he exists in you. Will you receive him today? Is there anyone who is this God? No one I know. He loves me so much. No one has died for me. He has died for me. Anyone? Can I pray for you? Just put your hand up. I want to know this God. For those of us who have received that gift, God has died for you. The whole heaven of witnesses stand there. They're not watching us. Witnesses of the life of faith. Many of them died as martyrs. Many of them lived difficult lives in this world. Suffered persecution. Were laughed at. But they were all blessed in their own way by the Lord. They received of His grace and they stand as a great cloud of witness in heaven today. And you will join them one day. What will your witness be? Are you living a life as a witness today? You don't have to wait until then to be a witness of God. You have experienced His love today. No one experienced God's grace and He preached 100 years of repentance. The Bible says He was a preacher of righteousness. Five years, five hundred years old was over when he began sent Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Six hundred years of his life, the floods came upon the world. Hundred years he was building the ark. Hundred years he was laughed at and scorned. And hundred years he continued to preach and be a witness for the world. Are you doing that today? None of us have even lived a hundred years today. But even in our short lives, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, are you even, how many times have you shared the gospel? How many times have you preached repentance and, you know, the gospel of Christ? We are all indwelled by the same powerful Holy Spirit that rested upon this man of old, empowered by the same fullness of the Godhead in you. <clears throat> are we living the life that He wants us to live? You don't remember anything, anything about the message this morning, just remember these two things. Walk by faith and not by sight and be a witness. There is a spiritual warfare going on behind what is, the, what is visible. And you are part of it whether you like it or not. It is happening around you, it's raging around you, it's affecting your family, 
your children, your, your, your spouse, your relatives, your friends. It's affecting them. The devil is walking around seeing who he may devour and devour many people. Are you going to be a victim? Are you going to be a statue? Are you going to rise up and answer the call as a soldier of Christ? Put on the whole armor of God and serve the Lord. You choose you this day whom you will serve. The gods of your fathers on the other side of the river. That's what Joshua said. Are you going to continue serving the gods of money, of pride, of the flesh of the world? In your life, or are you and your house going to serve the Lord? Something that you have to think about and answer for yourself. Dear me, Father Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for the testimony of Noah, Lord. We know that he is not a righteous man, but he was righteous in you because he received the grace that you bestowed upon him by faith, Lord. And like us, we who have exercised the same faith in you, Lord, we ask that you give us that same portion of strength and grace to do what we need to do. Empower us, Lord, as you empower Noah to do what is right, to obey you, not because we are afraid, but because we revere you, Lord, because we have respect unto you and who you are and what you've done for us. We give you glory, Lord, we pray that our lives will be a sacrifice, only acceptable unto you, that we will live by faith, not by sight. Lord, open our eyes and illuminate our minds to see the spiritual warfare that is going on around us, and we will look at things through your eyes, Lord, not through our earthly eyes, and to understand that we have to stand up and to uh, get to the fight, Lord, to serve you as soldiers of the cross, that, Lord, in sharing the gospel, your Holy Spirit will be able to convict the hearts of men, even as we sow the seeds of the gospel, Lord, that people will be saved and uh, saved from the death of hell, and we do not desire that to go, and that each and every life will come to glorify you one day as well. For those who are not yet saved and are hearing your word, we pray that you speak to them, convict them of their need for you, that they uh, repent unto God, faith in Christ Jesus. And for those of us who are saved, Lord, that you just empower us uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that even as we really push our will, that you will fill us up and you guide us and constrain us in the way that we ought to go. Commit all these things into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.